thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, can everybody hear me? Is that a good temper uh, temperature? Volume. <laughs> good. Um, so my title, Eyes and Ears Alert, comes from a, an editorial written in a UK uh, trade magazine back in uh, the 1970s, 1974. And it was a magazine written specifically for health visitors, so public health nurses who visit families with under fives. And according to its editor, Gladys Francis, in earlier years, the health visitor had fulfilled many roles. So she'd not only acted as a public health nurse, but also social worker, child protector, and even adoption officer. Many were also school nurses, and all were a familiar sight, walking or peddling round a prescribed area, eyes and ears alert. Now, Frances wrote her editorial in defense of health visitors, um, in response to a public inquiry following the brutal murder of a seven-year-old girl in England, on the south coast of England. Um, and in the inquiry report, a health visitor and a family doctor were criticised for their part in not keeping Maria safe. So, um, Francis, the editor of Health Visitor, had nostalgic memories of a time decades before when health visitors exercised a sort of kindly surveillance in their local neighbourhoods. And they were, um, in this idealistic vision of the past, the health visitor was known to every family, she could be called to the, from the garden gate, for advice or support, and she also knew and was told by local people who could be possibly abusing or neglecting their children. And Frances, this editor, her tone was somewhat defensive, but her comments signify that she accepted that physical abuse and the neglect of children were responsibilities. They were something that health visitors should take notice of and act upon. And these reminiscences of an earlier time were expressions of her anxiety about the present time. So they were about um, the kind of expectation of the public, the press and the government that health visitors would play an active role as protectors of children. By the mid-1980s, health visitors and family doctors would have even more to feel anxious about as the expectation that they would be vigilant and interventionist in relation to the abuse of children widened beyond the physical abuse and neglect and encompassed sexual abuse as well. So this uh, Maria Caldwell inquiry report happened in 1974 and I want to fast forward today and take you to 1987 where the first European Child Abuse and Neglect Conference actually took place in Greece it was held in Rhodes. I can't see anybody possibly old enough in the audience to have been there, but if anybody was, I'd love to talk to them. But I'm mainly going to talk about the UK uh, presenters at that conference, particularly uh, speakers associated with Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is a specialist children's hospital in London. And by 1987, Great Ormond Street's conceptual understanding of sexual abuse and the model of treatment, a therapeutic model of practice they were developing, meant that they were seen as the emerging UK experts in this area. And I want to discuss today their therapeutic model and how, in part, they became known as experts because of their connections to uh, medics in the US. Um, Great Ormond Street personnel, in turn, influenced practice across the UK. They had an awareness-raising ro role, and they were also involved in a very influential study by a study group sponsored by a, a Swiss pharmaceutical company called SIBA. So I'm going to talk about that and then talk about their presentations at the Rhodes Conference back in 1987, when they spread their message to participants from across Europe. And yet, even as that four-day conference was underway in Greece in 1987, there were challenges to the therapeutic approach that Great Ormond Street was developing in the UK. So they were being challenged by UK feminists, they were being challenged by the courts in, in the UK, and uh, there were also challenges coming out of events in the north of England, in Cleveland, where over a few months in 1987, a large number of children were removed from their parents and admitted to hospital under suspicion of uh, sexual abuse. And those events in Cleveland and the subsequent scandal and inquiry have been seen as driving practice around child sexual abuse away from this therapeutic model that Great Ormond Street developed and towards a more forensic term, so towards a, more, uh, a term that concentrated more on the evidence and more on law and order. 
Today, I want to rethink that a little bit, to consider Cleveland as just one of the challenges to the therapeutic turn and one of the challenges to what was an embryonic awareness of child sexual abuse amongst the UK practitioners by the mid-80s. And in relation to the challenges to heightening awareness around child sexual violence, what were the implications for community health practitioners like health visitors and family doctors? So they were seen from the outset as having this role in protecting children from sexual abuse, but could their eyes and ears really be alert to the signs and symptoms given by children and non-abusing parents in their communities. So to begin with the conference, it happened between the 6th and 10th of April 1987 in Rhodes. It was very well attended, so 400 people came from 32 countries, including many of the Eastern Bloc countries. And the representatives from the UK included um, speakers from the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the Tavistock Clinic, which delivered clinical work and training in child psychotherapy and family therapy, and Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And the papers given that day gave a sort of state of the art of um, child abuse and its prevention and treatment in, in, across all of the European countries. And the UK profile was quite flattering and perhaps a little bit overstated. So it noted the country's long experience in dealing with child abuse and neglect, and also the wide spectrum of therapeutic programs that he had been developed, particularly in sexual abuse. And today I'm focusing particularly on the Great Ormond Street um, Hospital team. Um, there had been a sexual abuse team established in 1981, so about six years before the Rhodes Conference. And Arnon Bentevin, a psychiatrist who was at the helm of that, presented at the Rhodes Conference in 1987. His twin interests were family therapy and child abuse. Um, I'm not going to say too much about his interest in family therapy, apart from to say that he was in touch with uh, clinicians in New York, in Canada, and in Milan, and his uh, focus on the whole family did influence his approach to child abuse, child sexual abuse. But his interest in, um, in child abuse generally happened when he read um, a paper by a paediatrician, a very famous paediatrician in child protection work, called C. Henry Kemp. He was based in Denver, and in 1962 he published a paper on uh, what he called the battered child syndrome. And um, Bentham was very captivated by what he wrote. And uh, he, he noted, Bentham noted many years later that nothing in his training in pediatrics or in child psychiatry had prepared him for, quote, this shocking expose of parental harm to children. In the 1970s, Kemp's publications on the battered child became quite widespread within UK uh, medical journals, nursing journals, and trade magazines. So nurses, doctors, pediatricians, psychiatrists became very aware of physical maltreatment and to a certain extent emotional abuse. But the, um, the sexual abuse of children was not recognised at all in these publications. And this slide shows a very rare exception when in an interview in a doctor's magazine, uh, the GP newspaper, Agony Aunt Marjor Marjorie Proop said, when I get letters from girls of 12 or 13 saying that their father or their uncle gets into bed with them and interferes with them, I am compelled to get in touch with the police. I ring up and say, send one of your nice lady probation officers in a miniskirt to investigate. Proops was recommending a nice lady probation officer as opposed to what she called, quote, a great big flat-footed policeman, end quote. And one can only surmise that her thinking was that a female officer going into the home could investigate the situation in a more sensitive and less threatening way. An alternative reading is that by sexualizing the figure of the female probation officer, she thought she might introduce the topic in a way that would capture the attention of English general practitioners, who were mostly male at that time. Either way, the point here is that this mention of child sexual abuse is exceptional in the trade press. It was generally ignored. And although definitely not in evidence in these comments, Feminism was actually playing an important role in the UK in this time in raising awareness about all forms of family violence, including child sexual abuse. And I will say a little bit more about this shortly.
So, as I've said, child sexual abuse was invisible in the materials that health visitors were reading in the 1970s. Things started to change in 1978 when Kemp made a visit to London. Uh, the second international conference on child abuse and neglect was being held in London, and he talked there about the prevalence and seriousness of sexual abuse. He said, quote, those who believe that incest had best be left a family affair failed to take into account the enormous emotional costs paid by many of these children. He told attendees that sexual abuse was, quote, as numerous and in many ways as serious as physical abuse, end quote, in terms of its long-term impact on children. And in early 1981, Kemp again visited the UK with his wife. She was a paediatrician and child psychiatrist and a collaborator with him in Denver. And they lectured to a group of interested professionals at the London headquarters of the SIBA Foundation, which was a Swiss charitable arm of a Swiss pharmaceutical company. And this talk was the catalyst for a, a study group called the SIBA Study Group, which met for uh, a number of years in the early 80s. Half of the group's 16 members were medics, so was, uh, the medics were heavily represented on the group, and it included uh, four psychiatrists, three of whom were connected to Great Ormond Street, uh, three paediatricians and a police surgeon. So that was the medical contingent. The remaining eight members had uh, police, lawyers, social workers, and the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The group produced a book which would be uh, formative in the way that child sexual abuse would be dealt with in the UK. And I'm going to say quite a bit about this book. And uh, just before I start, it's important to note that this study group and the sort of formation of the Great Ormond Street sexual abuse team happened pretty much at the same time. So um, the concept and the model of sexual abuse um, was developed, they were sort of interdependent in their production. So it's worth keeping that in mind as I, as I proceed. The first thing to say about this, this influential book is that it set out very clearly that community doctors and public health nurses had specific responsibilities and tasks in relation to child sexu sexual abuse. So this was within their remit. It was defined from the outset as not just something for hospital doctors or police surgeons or social workers. It was also um, a, a, something that health visitors and, and GPs needed to know about. And I flagged up at the beginning of my presentation that by 1974, the Health Visitors Journal, their association had accepted physical abuse was part of the remit and something that health vis visitors should notice and act upon. Now, in this book, SIBO uh, Group were setting out the same expectations for family doctors and health visitors in relation to child sexual assault within families. Um, the second point is that the SIBA group were recommending a therapeutic stance in relation to child sexual abuse. So by this time, many areas of the UK had developed procedures for dealing with child protection and abuse. However, the SIBA group recommended altering these procedures, uh, quote, to ensure that a therapeutic stance is taken and maintained in the centre of thinking and planning. And this is to do with when, when there is suspected child sexual abuse. And this therapeutic approach was to be curative, it was to be restorative, it was to be healing, and it was to involve the whole family, not just the um, abused child. Um, I, I, and, and I don't have time to go into the sort of model in detail, but it, you know, if people have questions later on, I can certainly respond to those. The SIBA group believed that by making therapeutic action central to their interventions with families, it would encourage children, family members, and even the perpetrators to seek help and not to avoid the authorities in cases of um, child sexual abuse in the family. And the aim was to marry this sort of therapeutic stance with control, what they call control, i.e. some sort of involvement of police courts, etc., and hence create a sort of fear of punishment that would contribute to the reduction of sexual abuse. The third thing to say about the SIBA group was that certain experiences were thought by them to create a greater vulnerability to sexual abuse in children. These included severe neglect and denial of affection to the child. And then they included a range of actions or inactions by the mother. So it was considered that a mother could create susceptibility to sexual abuse in her child 
through her emotional distance from the child. So that might be her sort of absence of mind, if you like, or her physical absence from the home. And it could be due to physical illness, mental illness, drug use, or perhaps um, the effects of her own sexual abuse as a child. Um, this absence might um, cause a retreat of the mother from the family, and that would cause, according to the SIBA group, her children and her husband may turn to one another for support, practical assistance or comfort, and the foundations of an incestuous relationship are laid. In other cases, a man deprived of his conjugal rights may turn to the nearest available source of gratification, a dependent child. <coughs> Nor were children blameless, according to the SIBA group, for they indirectly contributed to their own vulnerability to sexual abuse because it was thought that a man with unmet needs for either affection or sexual gratification, quote, may misunderstand the adolescent's behavior and be sexually aroused by it, or physical chastisement may lead the perpetrator to the excitement that blends into sexual activity, end quote. Not a lot was said about the um, uh, perpetrators of sexual violence against children. The assumption was that it was the fathers and stepfathers that were being discussed in this book. And there was reference to them perhaps being very meek or perhaps in contrast being very authoritarian. Um, and also that stepfathers posed a greater risk to children, not only because they lacked a biological bond to children, but often they might join the family at a point where the adolescent was maturing sexually without having experienced the kind of, quote, maturing effects of being involved in the earlier phases of child rearing. And these claims um, were based on only two studies. So one was a very small study of uh, 41 children by a psychologist called Lindy Burton, published in 1968. And the second was a bigger study of nearly 800 college students, which was carried out by US sociologist David Finkelhor in the late 1970s. And I lack the time to go into these studies in detail, but what is worth um, saying is that Finkelhor wrote a very long warning when he published about the reasons why his findings would, quote, overemphasize the victim's contribution about their experience. The SIBA book did not issue any such warning. So the way in which these supposed maternal defects were foregrounded in the SIBA book, ahead of any considerations of the perpetrator's motivations or responsibilities for sexual assault of their children, didn't go completely unchallenged in the 1980s, as I will return to below. But first, I want to return to Great Ormond Street and the way in which the United States connection helped establish them as the emerging experts on child sexual abuse in the UK. And this can be pinpointed to a survey suggested by a social worker from Henry Kemp's team in Denver. Her name was Pat Patricia Mrazek. And in 1979, she came to London to study advanced family therapy. She approached Arnon Bentevin, who you'll remember was the child psychiatrist at Great Ormond Street, with the idea of investigating how many children who had been sexually abused were being seen by doctors um, and police surgeons and uh, other um, practitioners in the community. And apart from small scale research, there was really no data in the UK at that time about the prevalence or incidence of child sexual abuse. So they sent a survey out to about 1,600 medics, including uh, family doctors, police surgeons, paediatricians and child psychiatrists, asking for details for a year of how many children had been seen. And again, I don't have time to say a lot about the results. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about that. But the important point here is that following the survey, Great Ormond Street received an increasing number of referrals about child sexual abuse. Uh, they were considered then to know something about it and um, they started their treatment program in 1981. And they usually saw the entire family together, including the perpetrator, for the initial assessment if the perpetrator admitted culpability for the assault. And they could carry out therapeutic work with individuals, with the couple, the marital couple, uh, with uh, children alone or in groups. And Bentevim's understanding of the causation was a family systems view. So just to be fair, he was absolutely clear that any adult who involved a child in sexual activity was abusing them, whether or not the child was threatened or coerced. 
but he saw individual family members as, quote, locked into required roles through mutual reinforcement processes and feedback patterns which are both problem-inducing and problem-maintaining, end quote. So, like the SIBA study group, Bentivim retained the family system's emphasis on what historian Joseph Davis calls, quote, the pathological family system, with the mother as the sort of cornerstone of that family system, a potential colluder in the abuse, and the daughter as potentially complicit in her own sexual assault. And moving beyond the Great Ormond Street treatment model to talk about their awareness raising, in the United States in the 70s, Kemp and his Denver colleagues had publicized the scale and impact of child sexual abuse, the roles of different professionals, and the development of their treatment model. In the 1980s in the UK, Great Ormond Street did the same. They spoke at conferences, they ran training, and they published research that took these key messages about child abuse from out of the specialist hospital, hospital and into the community and into the medical, uh, into medics uh, practice there. And the presentations at the Rhodes Conference in 1987 give you a flavour of their approach. So uh, in Rhodes, Bentivim and a social worker from the team at Great Ormond Street, Marianne Tranter, presented tentative results for over 100 sexually abused children and families that had been referred to them between 81 and 84. And they found that parents responded best to treatment when a legal sanction or a care order was in place to mandate their involvement in the treatment. Where the children's situation had improved, this was due to separation from the perpetrator rather than, quote, major restructuring of relationships, end quote. So uh, the, the results probably weren't giving them the answers they particularly wanted to hear themselves in terms of their therapeutic appro approach. And they weren't going to Europe and promoting their model as a panacea, but they were talking about it so that people understood the therapeutic stance and to raise awareness in the wider um, community. Another of the UK presentations was given by social worker Carolyn Ockel-Jones. Like Bentevin, Ockel Jones had been a member of the SIBA study group and she'd worked alongside him at Great Ormond Street to run one of their first groups for parents of sexually abused children. She was based at the Tavi, uh, Tavistock, sorry, and in her Rhodes presentation she described the process of making a preventative film about child sexual abuse. So this was a film targeted at children about personal safety. Uh, she made that with an educational video producer, Jessica Skippon, and they talked about the challenges in trying to get funding to make their video. Uh, and they said they faced funders who feared association. They didn't want to be publicly associated at that time with the topic of child sexual abuse. They faced professionals, medics, social workers, who feared that they would be bombarded with new disclosures from children and they wouldn't have the time or the skills to deal with those. And they were criticized for wanting to make a film that might teach children to fear adults. But she spoke too of a deeper feeling that she got as they tried to uh, get the film made. And she said, it was almost as if we were being accused of undressing and assaulting others in some perverse way. We were the spoilers of childhood innocence and were made to feel that in some way we were salacious and both contaminated and contaminating. Uh, they persevered and produced a short film called Kids Can Say No for 5 to 11 year olds and that was part of a prevention pack that was given out to practitioners and it also included the influential SIBA book so it was circulated very widely. Um, it, it wasn't available to the public so it was just for people working with children and it was meant to be shown to children in primary schools, in child health clinics or in child guidance clinics which is where our child and adolescent mental health professionals worked at that time. But a follow-up survey in 1986 demonstrated that few children had actually seen the video. Professionals were afraid of the topic, uh, afraid of the disclosures, and afraid that they didn't have the skills to deal with what would come if they did show the videos to children. So psychiatrist Eileen Vizard, also of Great Ormond Street, presented as well at the Rhodes Conference. Uh, she had trained at Great Ormond Street. She de described preventative group work of a different kind that she delivered at the hospital. This was for young children aged five to eight who had previously been sexually abused, and it was about uh, keeping safe in future. So uh, good and bad touches, understanding that 
uh, sexual abuse is the fault of the perpetrator and not the fault of the victim. Um, and helping children to talk if something like that happened to them again and to be heard by adults. She'd also made a videotape about the group work, helping other professionals she hoped, like health visitors in the community. And she'd actually gone to see health visitors and speak to them at their child assault prevention group meeting about the group work model. So these presentations um, by the Great Ormond Street uh, uh, practitioners at the Rhodes Conference provided attendees with examples of very practical work that they had developed since the beginning of the decade. They set out to promote awareness of child sexual abuse generally, to, pro to promote prevention and to describe ways to help children who had been sexually assaulted to protect themselves from further abuse. There were no critiques of their approach aired at that conference and that was probably because most of the criticism would come from UK feminists who weren't present. And in fact, um, when the Journal of Social Work Practice published papers of the proceedings later that year, they noted the omission of the feminist perspective and they included an article by feminists and social workers Mary McLeod and Esther Saraga from London on the ways in which, quote, cultural values and power relationships in our society, end quote, kept violence against women and children as family secrets, rather than tackling them as national problems. American feminism had played a key role in the UK in raising awareness about family violence, but UK feminists were not only reacting to their American counterparts, they were also speaking out and raising awareness for themselves. And in the same month as the Rhodes Conference, an event entitled Child Sexual Abuse Towards a Feminist Professional Practice brought together women in London who were working in the statutory and the voluntary sector. Um, they included social workers, health visitors, doctors, counsellors, researchers, rape crisis centre workers, uh, etc. Uh, and at the conference, and without naming specific individuals, McLeod and Saraga poured scorn on what they call the theory, uh, they, which they argued emanated particularly from child psychiatrists and uh, paediatricians, uh, very often men, that saw child sexual abuse as, quote, a symptom of something that is wrong in problem families, end quote. So they talked about this uh, theory being highly influential and presented as common sense and truth, but in actual fact, it was incorporating, quote, the most reactionary sexual politics, end quote, based on mother blaming and maintaining the ideology of the family as a place of safety and comfort. Citing the writings of Sarah Nelson, Judith Herman and Angie Ash, Saraga claimed it was efforts by rape crisis centre and by incest uh, survivor groups that activated public concern. So feminist theorists and activists were deeply suspicious of the therapeutic stance and they saw the claims by medics and psychiatrists about child sexual abuse as another form of gender, age and class-based oppression. The Great Ormond Street a team were also under scrutiny from other quarters. So during 1987, several family court judges criticised specific interviews that the team had carried out with children because they didn't consider them appropriate for forensic purposes as evidence in wardship and custody cases. When children um, did not disclose abuse spontaneously, uh, the Great Ormond Street team had developed a sort of second stage of interviewing, which they termed the facilitative stage. And at that, at, at that second stage, they would ask hypothetical questions, they would ask leading questions, and they would use anatomically correct dolls to try and encourage children to speak up. Um, and those materials were developed in the early 1980s for therapeutic purposes, but increasingly as the decade unfolded, they became used for diagnosis and the judi judiciary started to raise objections to that uh, and found them unsatisfactory in that context. Another challenge to the Great Ormond Street therapeutic stance came from North East England, as I alluded to in my, dis in my introduction, uh, from Cleveland, where uh, 121 cases of suspected uh, sexual abuse of children were diagnosed by two paediatricians. Uh, Caitlin is waving at me to say I'm nearly out of time, so I don't have, to go I don't have time to go into um, what happened in Cleveland in detail. Uh, but what's relevant is that um, uh, 
the uh, inquiry that uh, was formed uh, to look into the events um, made some recommendations and concluded that medical diagnosis had played too great a part in, this, in, the, in the removal of children in Cleveland. This um, changed the kind of uh, thinking about uh, uh, child sexual abuse and a range of scholars have seen Cleveland as reorienting professional responses to investigation and forensics and away from the doctor and away from a therapeutic response and instead towards a law and order um, approach. And so in terms of the implications of that, um, what I've tried to argue today is that in the 1980s, Great Ormond Street's team uh, served a role in the UK that went beyond their own work to spreading awareness. Uh, I've shown you some of the papers at the Rhodes Conference which exemplified this. They were criticised um, and um, I think what you can see here in this headline is that the criticism of the Great Ormond Street approach plus the scandal that emerged out of Cleveland meant that there was very negative coverage about doctors and about medics. And at a moment when health professionals were just very tentatively countenancing sexual abuse prevention and intervention as part of their role, these events discouraged them from developing a model of practice that would enable them to open their eyes and ears to the reality of child sexual abuse. Thank you.